we're going to continue on in First and Second Thessalonians, and we're going to look at Apostle Paul. His journey to Thessalonica, albeit it was only three weeks, it was very short, but in the end, he had much to say to them that we need to hear today. And one of the things that Paul says is, uh, I want to encourage you as a church. I want to build you up in the faith. I want to tell you, you know, I understand you're facing lots of persecution, but at the same time, you can stand firm, and God will help you get through whatever you're going through. My name is Reverend Derek Gellert, and I'm Pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Before we get into the sermon, though, let's do a little bit of background information. If you remember from the prior uh, sermons in this series, I talked a little bit about Paul's departure. He left Thessalonica very quickly. There was an angry mob that formed, and they were trying to basically oust Paul very quickly or try to get, get in touch with him, try to grab a hold of him, put him in prison. They had all sorts of intents for Paul that were not good, and Paul, because of this angry mob, he takes off as quick as he possibly can. And Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they journey all the way down to Berea, in Berea, Timothy and Silas decide to stay temporarily behind, and Paul goes, travels all alone, all the way down to Athens. And he's down in Athens, and he's, and you know, from the prior weeks, he was complaining. He was sitting back saying, look, I'm in Athens. I really would like to come and visit you, Church of Thessalonica. I miss you dearly. I barely got to know you, and I had to leave, but I want to come back with all my heart, but I can't. Satan is blocking the way. I cannot find a possible way to, to, to get back to you. So he could stand it no longer. So ultimately, he said, I'm going to send you Timothy. Timothy's going to come and visit you and basically help you out. Paul's intense longing was really deep. It was one of those things that he was sitting back saying, I fell in love with you. I love you so much as a church. And he said, I want to spend time with you. I want to help you out. I want to show you how to become more like Jesus. I want to help you through the difficult times, especially in the face of persecution. But I just can't find a way to do so. Paul said, I was absolutely overwhelmed. You know what? Sometimes I think we feel like that as Christians, don't we? We go through difficult times, and sometimes we feel like we're overwhelmed. Paul uses a, a word, it's called stego, and it basically means that keeping water, you know, outside of a boat. In other words, if you see the boat here, basically what it means is that this boat is designed to keep the water from coming inside of the boat. But Paul says that's not what's going on in his life anymore. He's saying, ultimately, my emotions have become so profound that they are leaking out all over the place, and I can't contain them any longer. So if you look at this beautiful painting here this person is doing, you can see how the pain is coming out over the sides and over the edges. Paul said, that's exactly what's going on in my life. I love you so very much, and I want to see you. I want to spend time with you, but I just can't get there because Satan won't, won't, he won't remove this roadblock in front of me, and I really, really want to be there. So he said, I got to find out how well you're doing, and I'm going to have to send Timothy, my brother in Christ, to go see you. Paul had already sent Silas away to Macedonia. And though it would mean that he'd be left alone in Athens, Paul said, I'm going to send Timothy anyway. Why? Because I got to know. I, I got to know what's going on. Now, we got to understand if we go back a couple series, we found out that Paul said, you know what? He had a ban on him and Silas, but Timothy, and Timothy was not an apostle in Jesus Christ, but he was one of the co-workers of Jesus Christ, and one of the co-workers with uh, Apostle Paul and uh, Silas. He said, Max, saying, you know what? Timothy didn't have the ban, supposedly. So therefore, Timothy could actually go back and spend time with them. Now, here's the thing about Timothy. Timothy was a messenger. But he was not an underling. He was, Paul wasn't saying, I'm going to send you my second best. Or I'm going to send you somebody who really isn't relevant to my ministry. I'm going to send them off to go visit you. It wasn't like that at all. Paul, if we go back into Scripture, and there's lots that's written about uh, Timothy from Apostle Paul, he felt ultimately that Timothy was like his son, both spiritually as a son, but also as his biological son. He was deeply in love with Timothy, and he had taken him underneath his wing, and he was like an apprentice, and he was teaching Timothy how to become more like Christ. So when he says, I have sent him to encourage you and to strengthen you, Paul wasn't saying, I'm just sending anybody to you. I'm sending my own son. My own child, so to speak, is going to come, and he's going to spend time with you, and he's going to find out how well you are doing, and he's going to be a great source of encouragement, and Paul certainly knew that. Today we're going to talk about encouragement. 
I do think living in a fallen world that we have all sorts of challenges, trials, and tribulations that we must face. I don't think it is easy to go through this world because ultimately we always have financial concerns, marital concerns. We have, you know, difficulties with other people who don't like us very much. We have all sorts of struggles that we go through. And I think the most difficult ones, of course, is health concerns. But we go through these struggles in our lives and it's not easy, is it? And we all need to be encouraged especially when Satan shows up and he says, I'm going to shoot a bunch of fiery darts at you, a persecution. And we know those aren't easy to handle, especially from Satan. And we need to be encouraged to continue walking for Jesus despite our trials, our tribulations. And we got to say, yes, Lord, I'm all in. And this is what Apostle Paul is trying to say to this very young church. He's saying, be all in, be all in. So the first point that Apostle Paul makes is this. Persecution is real. You know, we got to be reminded that they need everyone needs to be strengthened in their faith so that they might handle persecution rightly. You see, I think it's inevitable. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too as well, to the Christian believers. That's to us today. So the truth is, is the more that we walk and talk like Jesus Christ, the more we're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. And Paul said, ultimately, when that happens, we as believers need to build each other up in the faith, ultimately, so that we might be able to stand firm, so that we might remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here is trying to tell us something really important. The truth is, when you become a born-again believer, it doesn't mean all your problems, your trials, tribulations, and difficulties in life go away. That's not the case. Paul's sitting back saying he doesn't believe in the supposed health and wealth gospel. There is a group of Christians out there that strongly believe that if you give God money, then ultimately he'll give you more money back. Or if you faithfully serve God, then he's going to give you the best health in the world. There are many Christians out there that believe ultimately that if you just pray, any health concerns, financial concerns, any marital concerns will automatically just disappear into the sunset and God will make everything perfect and right. But we live in a fallen world and we know that that's not the case. And Paul's saying you will be persecuted for righteousness sake. Yes, you will go through difficulties. You will go through suffering. You will go through pain. And while sometimes God takes that away, He doesn't always, and sometimes you have to persevere through it. And this is what Apostle Paul is trying to say. Again, I quoted this verse, and it says, Jesus says, you know what? If you belong to this world, the world would love you very much. If you do the things this world does, if you stay on the broad path that leads to destruction, if you sin openly and freely, if you believe in multiple gods all at the same time, then this world would love you very much so, and you will be part of their clique, so to speak. But if you don't do that, and if you stay on the narrow path, and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you follow his rules and regulations, and you obey his commandments, and you put him first, then the world is going to hate you very much so. Because all the things that you do point to Christ, and the world hates Christ. And Paul says, ultimately, we've got to be ready for that. We've got to be ready for the fact that since we don't belong to this worldview that is out there, that anybody can do anything that they want at any time, and it's always considered to be right, if we don't grab a hold of that worldview, but we go against it, then we're going to have a problem. The world's not going to like us much at all. Paul warned the Christians, ultimately, at Thessalonica, that though they they received many benefits of salvation, there would be other things that would come along with saying yes to Jesus. You know, when you get born again, you get forgiveness of sins, don't you? On top of that, you go from death to life. You become born again. You get to know that you are adopted as a child of God, and you know that you're going to go to heaven and spend an eternity with him, and you're going to be at that great banquet in heaven. You know all those things are going to happen for you. But at the same time, Apostle Paul says, I don't want to paint you a rosy picture. Apostle Paul went through great grief, trials, tribulations, and difficulties in life. And Paul says, you know what? The world, like this person who's pointing their finger at you and the wagging it and laughing at you, the world is not only going to laugh at you, but the world is going to persecute you just like it did the great heroes of the faith, just like it did Apostle Paul, just like the world had actually persecuted Christ and put him upon the cross. Though suffering and persecution is far from pleasant, Paul reminds the Thessalonians that this is the part of your walk. It is normal. 
you know what? Sometimes we think, you know what? I'm the only one that's going through this. But the truth is, is that if you believe in Jesus, then being persecuted for righteousness sake is a normal activity. It's something that Jesus guarantees us. Now let's talk very quickly about a proper theology of suffering. It's not easy to suffer, is it? You know what the truth is, is that it's always intended for us to understand that if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and we lean upon him, that ultimately the Lord will help us through any trials, any difficulties, any suffering, and actually going through all of that, it can be for our good or the good of some other people that are around us. Now, if we are children, then we are hares, Paul says. And if we are hares, we're co-workers with Christ. And if we ultimately share in his sufferings, which we all have to do, Paul says, hang on because you're also going to share in his glory. You know, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how much suffering and pain that you go through, that'll be nothing in comparison, Paul says, to the glory that you're about to receive. And it's going to be eternal glory. In other words, you're going to spend an eternity with Jesus. And what talk about something amazing that we are promised, each and every one of us. James goes on and says, oh, by the way, suffering and pain and persecution actually has a great benefit for a believer. There was a lady that I read about who prayed for faith. She said, Lord, I am a weak person. You ever pray that prayer? I know I certainly have. I'm, I'm weak. I'm not a strong person in my faith. I don't rely on you. I, I get freaked out or I get all anxious about all sorts of different things in life. And as a result of that, Lord, I just want my faith to grow. I want to be like one of those people that I read about in Hebrews, those strong people of the faith. I want to be like them. I want to trust in you in all circumstances, Lord. That's a dangerous prayer. Because as soon as a lady prayed that, she soon realized what James was talking about. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when you face trials and tribulations of various different kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith will produce perseverance if you stay in the faith, if you stand firm in the faith. In other words, if we want to grow in the faith, oftentimes it's in the crucible, it's in the valley, so to speak, of tribulation that it best occurs. Why? Because when we need God and we have no other way of standing firm and we have no other way of getting up, that's when we rely on him. And that's when our faith grows, when we see him pick us up and carry us along. It's when we're on the mountains of blessings that ultimately we don't rely on him like we should and our faith doesn't grow as much. So in the end, what does God do? I think sometimes he allows us to go through suffering and pain so that we might grow. And we certainly do. If we remain in him, we will lack absolutely nothing, James says. Paul goes on and he says, And in persecution we're to rejoice in our weakness because Christ's power is made perfect in us. And you know what? We should be thankful and happy that we're counted worthy to be persecuted for righteousness sake in the first place. So Paul says in his theology of suffering, he says, Suffering, tribulations, persecution actually has an incredible benefit for believers if handled rightly in front of the Lord. In other words, if you stand firm and rely on Jesus, then actually in the most difficult times, you'll find yourself getting the closest to the Lord. Now, of course, it never feels like that when you're in the midst of a storm like you see here. It never feels good, does it? It never feels like you're getting closer to the Lord, but you are. And after you get out of the storm, you soon realize, my goodness, I was closer than I realized. Actually, uh, while some of my thoughts were anxiety, most of my thoughts were joy, unspeakable joy, and closeness to the Lord that I never thought was possible. I got thinking about this. We do live in a hostile world, that's certainly for sure. We live in a world, ultimately, that I think is walking away from God. And you can see that picture there, this person who's turned their back on Christ and walking away. I think the world certainly has done that. When it talks about enemies of the cross, I think there's a lot of them today. Because ultimately, there are more and more atheists than ever before. The fastest growing religion, they say, according to studies, is no religion at all. Because people no longer believe in God. They believe in many things, but not a singular God, that's for sure. And our society, I think, is becoming more anti-Christian. In other words, more and more people actually don't want to hear the word Jesus spoken anywhere. Now, if we look at North America specifically, Christ has been taken out of our schools. You can't talk about Christ in the schools, in the shopping malls, in the government system. No longer belief in Christ is a center of our society, but now Christ, Jesus, the gospel message is just one voice amongst many, and it's no longer tolerated very much by our society. 
So if you go out and tell people about Jesus, you can expect them to actually go against you and to persecute you. Now, we got to be careful about this. While we know physically we're not likely to be actually persecuted, nobody's going to chuck us in jail. Nobody's going to beat on us physically. Nobody's going to give us that kind of grief. But emotionally, Satan's darts are still very effective because we're created to love people. We want to have relationships with people. We don't want to have people ultimately to not like us. We all want to be liked. And when people don't like us and actually go against us and exclude us from their group, it really has a profound effect upon us. And certainly when, when Satan's fiery darts come at us, we got to put up the shield of faith, don't we? we got to believe that God's going to take care of us. And we want to do that. The second thing that Apostle Paul says to this church that's really struggling is he says, I'm going to send to you Timothy. Now, we got to think about this just for a moment. Paul says, Satan's been blocking my way. I, I, I cannot find a way to actually make it back to you. It's like this guy with this stone. He's trying to push it up the hill even though he knows he can't do it. And, and Paul's saying, I would come to you. And if there was any possible way I could do it, I would be there. But he said, I can't find a way to do it. I just can't. Satan's got a roadblock that I just cannot get it out of there. I can't move it in any way whatsoever. And he's saying, you know what? The reality is if he's doing that to me, what is he doing to you? And Paul sitting back when I left, there was great persecution because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got thinking, you know what? What if the church is suffering that very same persecution? Now, Apostle Paul could speak about this because he knew what it was like to be persecuted. He said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, he says this. He says, you know, I was beaten. Can you imagine? Lashes. I received 40 lashes minus one five times, beaten with rods three times, pelted with stones, shipwrecked three times, and in danger from both Jews and Gentiles. Paul knew how hard it was to stand firm in the faith. He knew all about that. So he's looking at the church and he's saying, ah, are you still in the faith? Are you still alive in Christ? Or do you still believe in him? Are you still meeting as a church? He was asking a whole bunch of different questions. Now, what was Paul not saying? I know some people would say, well, maybe Paul's saying that maybe they're going to do uh, apostasy. In other words, maybe the people of Thessalonica, he was really worried that they would walk away from Christ and no longer be born again. I don't think that was, is what Paul's talking about, because I don't think people, once they're born again, can just be taken out. Satan can't snatch them out and take them, and they're no longer born again. I don't think there's anything in Scripture that says that can happen. But here's the thing. What was Paul's real fear? His fear was they would stop meeting together. His fear was they would no longer publicly go out in the world and show them what it means to be a Christian. They no longer go out and give reasons why they have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. And Paul's fear was if they stop meeting and they stop proclaiming the good news, where would be the light? Where would the light actually shine? And, and where would they see that? And this is what Paul was really worried about. He was worried ultimately that, you know what, the Satan who lost the battle for their soul, he was worried ultimately that they would be basically deceived. Now, there are many Christians, I think, today that are deceived. There are many Christians that believe they can stay home, not go to church, and still have a really good walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, there is a component of our walk that is very personal with Jesus. Yes, and we do have to pray individually. We have to read the Bible individually. We have to meditate on God's word, and certainly we're responsible for our own salvation. That is all true, and that is really good. The devotions, some of the spiritual devotions that we have are absolutely critical. The spiritual disciplines mold us, shape us, help us to get closer to the Lord, and they're often done individually but they're also done corporately. You see, we need each other. And Paul talks about this. We are one body of Christ and we need each other because some people are given some of the spiritual gifts and others are given other ones. And together we form one body of Christ. And Paul says, don't stop meeting together. It's critical that you do because this is how you strengthen one another, encourage one another, build each other up in the faith. It's critical that the church in which Christ died for ultimately would continue to meet with one another. And then Paul's saying, make sure you do meet. I got thinking about, uh, like Apostle Paul, we can ultimately become very concerned with the spiritual welfare of other believers, I think, without showing any anxiety. 
And I got thinking about this. Is it wrong to be concerned about other people? After all, in the Bible, it says, do not worry about our life, Matthew 6, 25. Do not be anxious about anything, Philippians 4, 6. And is it a, a sin to worry? I think it is a sin to worry on the grounds that when we stop trusting in God and we start worrying and start thinking about our own solutions, that's definitely a sin. But is it a sin to be concerned and to pray for one another? And the answer is absolutely not. We have to channel our concerns into prayer and petitions to the Lord and have trust that ultimately he will help the other person out that we are praying for. We have to have concern ultimately about the welfare of other people, but not to the point where we forget that God's sovereign and and fully in control. And that's the difference. When we start thinking that, you know what, oh, this person's doomed, this person's not going to make it, there's no possible way for them to survive, that's when we start getting into that area of sin because we're very anxious. When we forget that God works for the good of those who love him, when we forget about that, then of course it becomes a sin. Paul goes on and he says this. He says, I want to make sure that you continue to tell the good news. And this is where Paul's real fear came from. He was afraid that they would stop doing that. And I got thinking, the Thessalonians, ultimately, he was worried that they wouldn't meet together anymore. He was afraid, ultimately, that the church should become like ground zero, like this church, completely abandoned, out in the middle of nowhere, and then over time, it was just falling down. He was concerned that Satan was attacking them so fiercely that they weren't meeting anymore. They weren't telling people about Christ in the public anymore, but instead, they were actually staying away. He was concerned, ultimately, that the people would be bitter towards him. Think about it for a moment. Paul had been there for three weeks, and he had to leave very quickly. And now this church is being persecuted, and Paul's not there, their spiritual father, so to speak. And they may have looked like this individual that you look into his eyes and you say, you know what, you look very bitter about the circumstance. This guy's not smiling. He's sitting back looking at his circumstance and thinking, why? Why did you come in the first place? Why did you show up, Apostle Paul? Why did you bring all that trouble to us? We didn't need all this trouble. And Paul was afraid they were thinking some of these thoughts. When Timothy conveyed to Paul that this newly established church had fond memories of their time together, Paul was overwhelmed with joy. He was their spiritual father, and he was sitting back saying, I'm so joyous, ultimately, that you're not holding anything against me. You've actually got fond memories of me, and you understand the circumstances that you are in. It's because you're born again, not because of me. And Paul's saying, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord all about that. And while their shared love for each other caused his heart to leap for joy, even more so was the truth. They hadn't abandoned God. They hadn't stopped, you know, meeting together. They hadn't stopped living their life for the Lord. They hadn't stopped telling other people about Jesus Christ to the world. Despite facing all sorts of assaults from various different individuals, they were still sitting back saying, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. We still believe in you. We still trust you. We know you love us. We know you died for our sins. We know you atoned for us, and we're deeply in love with you. We're going to continue fighting the good fight as long as you hold us up. They believed in what but one God, and they told the whole community and continued telling them there is but one God. There's not multiple gods. There's only one. And if you want to make it to heaven, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. You cannot possibly get to heaven without me. You have to come through me. You have to believe in my atoning sacrifice. I think this world desperately needs to know that. This world needs to know that following the footsteps of Jesus ultimately is not easy for Christians to do, but necessary for the people around us. During times of blessings and and, and all sorts of wonderful things that's happening to us, it's easy to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, but not so easy when we're going through trials and tribulation. To keep one's eyes fixed on eternity when people are bombarding you and saying that, you know what, you're not a good person, I don't like you very much, and you're foolish for believing about all in God, is not an easy task to do whatsoever. When suffering and pain becomes what feels like our only friends, you know what, it's not easy to sit back and say, I trust him. I trust that he will make his power perfect in my weakness. I trust the Lord will take care of me. I trust the Lord will only allow those people to persecute me to the extent that he will allow it to happen in the first place. And that brings me to my next point. Paul says, stand firm. 
He's so excited that he finds out that the people, these this small little church that had been formed just in three weeks of him preaching there, were standing firm amongst a whole bunch of people that wanted to give them great harm. He was sitting back saying, I fully understand it's not easy. I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling, Paul says. He makes an admission that he's saying, I found it really hard. And he said, if I found it hard, I know you do too as well. He said, I faced persecution on all sides. He said, I went to Philippi. And once I got to Philippi, they threw me in jail. They beat me. And I had to escape barely with my life. I went to Thessalonica. I spent three weeks there. And then this angry mob is formed. I don't know what they're going to do to me, but they don't have good things intended for me. And they wanted to arrest me. And I had to flee from there too as well. I got into Berea. And, and all the way down into Athens. And of course, when I get into Athens, I find out that the people believe in many gods and they think I'm absolutely foolish and they ridiculed me and poked fun at me. And now I'm sitting in Corinth. And by the time he gets to Corinth, Paul says, I'm feeling beaten. I am feeling weak. I have fear. I have trembling. Paul's being very honest with us. Have you felt that way? Have you felt like you're absolutely beaten? Have you got out in the world and found that people really are not very nice when it comes to Christianity and your belief in but one God? And do you find sometimes that's almost overwhelming? Certainly Paul did. And he tells the group, guess what? I struggle too. And I am wrestling with it too. And God actually had to go to Paul and say, oh, by the way, you're okay. I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will encourage you. I will lift you up. I mean, sometimes I think we need to hear that probably every single day. Hear that, you know what, Jesus Christ loves us and he will strengthen us. Knowing that the Thessalonians were also able to withstand persecution and remain firmly committed to the traditions that they were taught brought great joy to Paul's heart. Why? Because when we speak about God's word, it's a matter of life and death. I like this picture that I found on the internet. And it's a picture of a stick, and it's in the middle of the desert. And this old, you know, kind of dilapidated-looking stick is holding up this little sign that says, Salvation is this way. So you can stay here in the desert and perish, or you can go on the narrow path which leads to righteousness and eternity with Jesus. And I love this, this particular sign because this is what we're saying to the world. You are in a wilderness. You are in a desert. You are destined to the pits of hell. And we know that, and we don't want you to go there. But what we want you to do is become born again. And we want to get out there and give them reasons why we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way we live our lives, we want to let our light shine to this world. And we we don't want to just expose the evil deeds of this world and show them they need a better path. But we also want to show them where we're going. We're going to spend eternity with Jesus, but they can also go there too as well. And we want to tell the world all about that. If the Thessalonians had forsaken the role as a witness, the question would become, and Paul was wondering about this, then who would tell the people of Thessalonica about the Lord? And if they don't know anything about the Lord, how would they ever become saved? And Paul was basically saying in Romans chapter 10, 14, that we are critical. We are the individuals. We are Christ ambassadors, Paul says to the church of Corinth, and we're making a a plea to the world, be reconciled unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our role as ambassadors to tell the world, and it is a life and death role. And, And Paul's saying, I want to remind you how important this responsibility is, because when you tell people about Jesus, you're telling them there's a better way to live your life, and there's a better destiny for you if you just say yes to the Lord. I got thinking, it's far from easy, isn't it? To trust and obey and profess the truth considering uh, Christ to a warped and a strange generation that doesn't believe in him. How we live our lives, both when we think other people are watching us and when people are actually not watching us, actually matters. This world needs to show, see that, that we believe so much in Jesus Christ that we're willing to basically stay on his path. We're willing to obey his commands because we love him and because we can see how the commands lead us into righteousness and into holiness, and that's what we want. We want Jesus Christ to be pleased with us, but at the same time, we also want to deny our own desires, our own goals, our dreams, take up our cross and follow Jesus because we want to be like him and we want to please him and we want to let our light shine to this world. Are we doing that? 
May we boldly, with humility, courage, and above all love, may we go out in the world that is simply not our home and tell the whole world that Jesus Christ died once and for all, for all people. And while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Let us tell the world. They can be saved. And the thing is, is that time is running out. We may or may not be in the last times, but we certainly are starting to see signs, so we could be coming close. And if we are, the world doesn't have much longer to say yes to the Lord. I want to finish with this. And this is a message to the church of which I pastor at. Paul finished off this section with saying thanks to the church. And I want to say thanks to the church in which God's allowed me to minister to. Like you, I've tried to accomplish much in my life on this earth. I have gotten degrees, I've gotten bachelor degrees, I've gotten a master's, and I've become a proficient CPA. I got married, I had children, but most important accomplishment that I've ever done in my life or could ever do is I said yes to Jesus. I became born again. I've gone from death to life. That's the most important decision of all, for sure. Christ took my shaky feet, which were destined for the pits of hell, and he placed me on the firm foundation as one of his very own children. Today, I not only thank God for my salvation, but I also thank God for each and every one of you within the church in which Christ has sent me to. I find myself falling more deeply in love with you every single day, and I pray earnestly that whatever trials and tribulations that you are going through, that you would rely on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would pick you up ultimately when you fall, and he would make his power known perfect in your weakness, and that you would see that. And though I struggle daily to invite God to plow furrows into my own heart, I ultimately pray that the shepherd might continue to mold, humble, and reshape both you and I into his glorious image every single moment of every day because we desperately need him and we need to be born like him. While I do not profess in any way, shape, or form to be spiritually superior to any of you, and I certainly do not, I feel overwhelmed with joy that God allowed me to be your pastor. And I feel overwhelmed with joy that I can be your servant and I can serve you in the way that God wants me to. So I have a plea for you. I pray that each and every one of you would build each other up in the faith. I pray that you would stand firm in your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and tell the world why you have reasons for hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them how much Christ means to you and tell them how excited you are of the eternity and the heaven you're about to go to. I thank the Lord for all of you, and I just pray that you continue to grow in the faith and become spiritually mature, and that you would know him to the full measure that is possible. And I just thank him just for his grace and his mercy for each and every one of you, and for me especially, for I am a sinner saved by grace through faith, and I am so happy that I know where I'm going, and I hope and pray, any of you who are listening, I hope you know where you are going to as well. Amen and amen to that.